about X-ray emission spectroscopy, which, although in terms of the physics, is a relatively old method, in terms of its applications in chemistry, has really only seen um, real growth in about the last decade or so. Before I get started, though, um, I want to um, especially thank um, all of the Orga team, all of the tutors and the organizers, um, and especially my group, who's um, been doing the X-ray tutorials, um, and specifically um, Stefan, Nicole, Yoan, and Vlad. So um, hopefully this afternoon you guys um, might have more questions for them after my talk. So, you know, keep it lively for them. They like a challenge, so, um, <laughs> and it keeps our life more interesting. Okay, so over this week we've been sort of taking a journey through different um, aspects of spectroscopy, and we've pretty much covered um, the entire um, electromagnetic spectrum. Yesterday you started um, with EPR down in the microwave range, and up into the X-ray or gamma range with MOS Bowers. Well, now, of course, with MOS Bauer, the only difference between gamma rays and X-rays is the source, and that gamma rays are coming from a natural source. But today we're going to focus on primarily on X-ray spectroscopies. So these are um, spectroscopies that use energies on the order of hundreds of electron volts to tens of thousands of electron volts. So for the most part, we're talking about deep core excitations of atoms, and we're using that to get information about both the electronic and the geometric structure. Okay. So most of the time, for many of you who may be familiar with X-ray spectroscopy, you probably think about it as something that falls in the realm of the synchrotron scientist, and that's true for the most part. Most of the spectroscopy I'll talk about today has um, typically been done using a synchrotron source. Um, where these actually originated out of particle colliders in the physics community. Um, but the realization was that when one accelerates um, particles um, in a circular um, pattern, at tangents to that, you can produce very intense sources of X-rays. And this is a plot of photon energy relative to spectral brightness, um, where spectral brightness basically refers to the concentration of radiation. How many photons can I get in a given area per second? And one of the important features about synchrotrons in general, um, if some of you are familiar with laboratory X-ray sources, they would have peak spectral brightnesses um, um, somewhere in um, this range at the lower end of the spectrum. And as we get to more and more modern synchrotrons or free electron lasers, we find they're on the order of a million to a million times brighter than standard laboratory sources. And so this is why, at least for these types of spectroscopy, um, these are very useful sources. And in the last decades, one has seen an incredible increase in the number of synchrotrons worldwide. Right now, there's roughly, depends on how you want to count them, but roughly about 60 major synchrotron user facilities, plus additional smaller ones. Now, for my own research group, we always kind of use this, you know, as a recruiting tool because this is um, actually a map of where my group has been um, in the last year to do measurements, so everywhere from Japan to Brazil to U.S. and all over Europe. Um, so there is a lot of interesting things about synchrotron science, certainly if you like to travel. Um, I normally leave out the part that when they do travel there, they don't get to sleep, but, you know, that's just a side note, so if, you know, <laughs> you want to go to Grenoble, but spend most of your time underground, um, it's, it's a feature. Um, the, the other thing, though, about synchrotron sources to sort of remember is that this really is moving into a realm where more and more of this, I think, in the future will happen in regular laboratories. So um, in terms of synchrotron sources, the first tabletop synchrotrons were actually introduced several years ago now, first by a company called Lithium Technologies in the US. Um, this is about a 10 million euro instrument, so not everyone is buying one, but um, there, there are possibilities. Um, one can also think about other ways to approach this in a laboratory, um, and that's something my group and I are working on. We're building an in-house dispersive emission setup um, using um, a, a metal jet-based X-ray source, and the idea is that we'll be able to do time-resolved X-ray emission, and we hope to have this um, sort of fully commissioned by the end of next year. Um, so it's more just a reminder, if you think, oh, I would never go to a synchrotron, I don't really see myself using these methods, I would argue that um, probably over the course of most of your careers in the next decade or so, we're going to see a real evolution of the accessibility of X-ray-based spectroscopy 
And I think um, a lot of that has to do with its broad general utility, which I hope you'll see more of later. Um, but for those of you who are interested in the sort of more hardcore synchrotron spectroscopy or free electron laser spectroscopy, um, that's also a growth area. This is the XFEL in Hamburg, which provides a femtosecond pulsed source, so effectively an X-ray laser. Um, and this is opening up really exciting opportunities in very short time domains that were previously accessible only in the optical regime. So this is another exciting growth area. Okay, but let's get into just the basics of um, the talk today. What I would like to do is to begin by introducing you to X-ray absorption spectroscopy, um, most commonly, of course, abbreviated as XAS. You'll also see this is abbreviated as Zanes for the X-ray absorption mirror edge structure. We'll begin by just going through some basic definitions, talk about the experimental uh, configuration, the information you can get out of it, and sort of how one interprets this data from both a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. Um, we'll then go into the details of um, XAS, um, and then finally towards the end, um, a little bit about extra emission. And then we'll just see how we do on time, whether or not um, there's time for the applications or whether or not you just um, look through those later to get a better idea. Okay, so let's start with the basics of really any um, basic X-ray absorption spectrum. So the idea here is that an edge results whenever a core electron absorbs an energy equal to or greater than its binding energy. Um, and we basically then just label the edges according to the shell that that electron originates from. So in the case of a K edge, we're talking about a 1s excitation. L edges would be 2s and 2p. 3s, 3p, 3d would refer to M edges. Now these vary greatly, of course, because they are core electrons, so just to, as an example, the copper K edge takes about 9,000 electron volts to ionize a 1s core electron. The L edge takes about an order of magnitude less energy, so around 900 electron volts, and then um, down again to around 100 electron volts for the corresponding M edges. And each of these, of course, is governed by different selection rules and then gives us slightly different information that we'll talk about during this talk. But the very nice thing about it, of course, is that these edges for copper, of course, are very different in energy than um, the corresponding iron edges. So the iron K edge differs from the copper K edge by 2,000 electron volts. And this is nice because it makes X-ray absorption inherently a very element-selective technique. So we can tune to that core energy and select just for a specific atom of interest. And in principle, then, one can do that at any accessible absorption edge um, without the need for certain requirements in terms of, of spin state or isotope labels or anything that you might need for more conventional um, paramagnetic or vibrational data. Okay. okay, so let's just look at a standard X-ray absorption spectrum. When one looks at an X-ray absorption spectrum, what you're looking at formally is the measurement of the absorption coefficient mu as a function of energy. And generally what one observes is the sharp discontinuity of the spectrum. This is what we refer to as an edge. That's effectively the point at which ionization actually occurs. Okay? Beyond the edge then, um, once that um, electron has been ionized to the continuum, it can then interact with neighboring atoms, um, producing the, the well-known XAS or extended X-ray absorption fine structure region. This gives you primarily metrical information about an absorber, whereas the Zanes region um, gives you primarily um, electronic as well as geometric information. And so what I'd like to do first is focus a little bit on the information that you can get out of the Zanes, and then we will move later to the XAS. Um, but I guess it's just perhaps a point, imp important to point out why you might be interested in looking at X-ray absorption edges and Zane spectra in detail. As I already pointed out, one of the biggest advantages of X-ray absorption is that it is element specific and that we can apply it to almost any system in any form. So gases, solids, um, flowing solutions, frozen solutions, etc. Um, the other useful part about it is that it's very sensitive to the local geometric and electronic structure of absorbers. So this means, especially for those of us doing inorganic chemistry, it's quite useful to get out information about the oxidation state, the spin state, ligation, and site symmetry. It does provide um, detailed electronic structural information um, and 
as some of you may have already learned in the practicals, um, zanes are a good way for us to probe radiation damage. Um, and this always sounds strange, but of course one has to remember with these intense ionizing um, sources of radiation, we do tend to actually destroy matter. Um, and this is something that, for instance, um, crystallographers have only embraced a little bit more in, in recent years, so that when you maybe do protein crystallography with a synchrotron, um, parallel X-ray absorption um, characterization can really help you understand um, what you have done to your sample. Okay. Um, in addition, um, the sort of useful thing about Zanes in particular is that data collection times are relatively fast. So for most solid state materials, um, we can collect spectra in a matter of minutes. Um, of course, for very dilute solutions, then the, the time scales up. Um, but it's much faster to get a Zanes measurement because it's intrinsically intense compared to excess. Um, it, it also requires less concentrated samples than excess. We can do X-ray absorption at multiple edges, so if you have a sample that has both iron and sulfur in it, you can measure both of those and get a little bit more detailed information. Um, and of course, I think an important lesson just generally, um, and sort of a theme that I hope you get out of this whole summer school, is that X-ray absorption can be used to complement other methods. And sort of, I think an idea that hopefully comes out of this school is that each method that you use from EPR to Mossbauer to X-ray absorption should hopefully um, come together with theory to form a cohesive picture. And so that's sort of ultimately the goal in all of this. Okay, so before we go into more detail, let's just briefly speak about this experiment and how one goes about doing this. So in general, um, the way you set up an X-ray absorption experiment is really not so different than um, a UV vis measurement that many of you have done before. Um, instead of having your optical source, you have your X-ray source from a synchrotron. Um, you measure the incident intensity in an ionization chamber. You then pass beam through your sample and measure an ionization chamber behind it. So in the simplest form, um, this kind of looks like a fancy absorption um, measurement, and in fact, that's all it is. Now, depending on the energy that we're interested in, the experimental setup will change. So this setup that I'm showing you um, is what we would normally refer to as a hard X-ray um, beam line. And that means that typically you would need 5,000 electron volts or higher so that the X-rays can basically readily pass through air. Okay? And so this is actually, of course, all enclosed inside a big leaded hedge when we do the actual experiment. Now, as we go to lower energies, um, so say 2 to 5 keV, the X-rays will no longer have a very long path length in air. And so instead of being able to enclose the hedge um, just in air, one might often go to a helium environment. Um, at energies lower than about 2,000 electron volts, typically everything needs to be enclosed in vacuum. And this, of course, um, presents new experimental challenges that I won't go into today, but it's something that's helpful to be aware of. Okay. There's also other more specialized setups for things like X-ray emission or um, high resolution X-ray absorption. Um, I won't really go into that in detail. I'll just touch on it briefly at the end of this talk. Okay, but the nice thing, at least, um, about being a synchrotron user is that most of this, so even if you're not familiar with using synchrotrons, um, for a simple X-ray absorption experiment, most of this is done for you in advance, um, and the beam line actually um, that enters into this hedge at this point, the user generally doesn't need to worry anything about the upstream optics. But I just want to comment briefly on what those upstream optics actually are. So basically, coming off the synchrotron ring, we have an insertion device, um, which can be um, either a wiggler or an undulator, but basically these are magnets with um, poles of alternating sign that increase the intensity of the beam. The beam then can be focused by um, X-ray mirrors. Um, typically, um, these have coats of either rhodium or nickel, depending on the energy we're running at. And then after um, that, we use a double crystal monochromator to actually select the energy, so the selection is just based simply on Bragg's law. We can further focus the beam, and then it enters into the experimental hedge. Now, just so you have an idea of what these look like, um, this is a, a monochromator, so a double crystal monochromator. These copper coils are actually the liquid nitrogen cooling system for this optic. 
Does anyone have an idea why we're cooling an octave with liquid nitrogen? Any ideas? Exactly, because of the high energy. So this is another sort of statement about the intensities of these sources. If we were to put straight beam from a, a modern insertion device beamline onto a silicon optic, we would destroy it. And so basically to minimize destruction of our optics and our mirrors, they typically need intense cooling. Um, so oftentimes that is liquid nitrogen. Um, and similarly, here's the x-ray mirrors. These are typically about um, a meter long and, as I mentioned, coated with an appropriate metal. So again, this is just sort of a simple schematic of our, what we already went through. We just need some sort of x-ray source, some sort of monochromator to do energy selection, and then we're basically just going to do a straight up absorption measurement when we can. Um, so this is the simplest way to do this experiment. If we have high enough energy x-rays, we have the luxury of maybe having an energy reference foil in here at the same time that we can measure in another ionization <coughs> chamber. For dilute samples though, and for probably the majority of samples people would be interested in, we almost never do a true absorption measurement. Rather, we do a secondary measurement in fluorescence and make the assumption that those fluorescence events are proportional to the absorption. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but just in general, in some respects, um, when we call it extra absorption spectroscopy, it's a bit of a misnomer because we're rarely measuring the true absorption event. Okay, so this, um, again, is what I already said. We can do the direct absorbance, um, so a, a true transmittance measurement, or we can measure a secondary process. So for instance, after I create that 1s core hole, I can wait for a 2p electron to refill that 1s core hole. It will produce a fluorescent photon. This would be referred to as a k-alpha line. And I can detect those fluorescent photons as proportional to this initial absorption event. Okay? I can also detect any other secondary processes that are happening. It doesn't have to be fluorescence. I could also, for instance, um, detect electron yield processes. The ratio of electron yield to fluorescence will vary depending on energy. So most of the part um, that I'm going to talk about today is hard x-ray work where one has higher fluorescent yields than electron yields. Okay, okay. and so just um, a sort of emphasis again on the samples. I already mentioned that the big advantage is the samples can be measured in any form. So we measure solids, liquids, gases, frozen solutions. This is a big advantage. Um, typical concentrations depend on the specific beam line and the specific source. But a sort of general rule of thumb is we typically will say we need at least one millimolar of an absorber of interest. Um, but there's certainly precedence, and we have done measurements as low as 50 micromolar. Um, you can also do in certain cases, when you have a very focused beam, very small volumes, um, we've done droplets as small as 10 microliters with focused beam. This sounds good, but of course the sample volumes can still be very high if the rate of radiation damage is high. So it's not unusual for very high valent, interesting, sensitive intermediates to last only seconds in the beam, and then you need many of these droplets. Okay, so let's take a look at a metal K-edge X-ray absorption in a little bit more detail. And um, I'm going to use in this example just um, an energy diagram for iron. And so what we're basically looking at here are the excitations to unoccupied levels. So we basically have first the possibility that an iron 1S can transition into unoccupied 3D levels. That's here, these transitions shown in blue and the area boxed here in blue on my graph, which is referred to as the pre-edge region. Okay? This is going to be relatively weak because it's a 1s to 3d transition. It has a delta L of 2, so it's dipole forbidden, quadrupole allowed. It means intrinsically it's about 100 times weaker than the main edge jump um, shown here in red, which corresponds to a dipole allowed 1s to 4p transition with a delta L of 1. Okay? So let's take a look at the kind of information we can get out of these edges in a little bit more detail. One thing that we can readily tell from these edges is information about the oxidation state. And so you already had a nice introduction to this in Frank Meyer's keynote where he showed you his series of ruthenium complexes. And the general sort of rule here is that, of course, as we increase the effective charge, it takes more energy to pull out that 1s electron, and the edges go up in energy. The edges, though, 
one has to be careful because there are many competing factors that contribute to the edge. It turns out they're also sensitive to coordination number. This is a series of copper one complexes. They can be perturbed by covalency, and they can be affected by 4P mixing. And so what I would like to do um, is to go through um, each of these effects in detail. And when we talk about these effects, we can use different models to describe them. We can, for instance, describe what's happening qualitatively um, in a very empirical sense, um, use the edges sort of as fingerprints, compare things to, to known models. And this is really a very useful way to think about extra absorption spectra. It's certainly the way the majority of the literature inter interprets these spectra. If we want to be a little bit more quantitative, we can use molecular orbital-based descriptions to get a little bit more quantitative. We can try to understand energy and intensity distributions using ligand field approaches. And of course, we can couple it to density functional theory calculations. And that's something um, that is also happening in the practicals. Um, I'm mentioning here, of course, you can use um, explicitly time-dependent DFT. For emission, we use um, very simple one electron ground state DFT. Um, but what we find is this works well for bound state transitions. So um, primarily for the pre-edge, it starts to break down in the rising edge. There are corrections we can do to the DFT potentials to make them behave a little bit better further into the rising edge. Uh, but at some point, um, these kinds of approaches no longer simulate the full spectrum. And this is where one goes into more multiple scattering based approaches. This is typically how we interpret XAFS data, but it's also really required for the higher energy rising edge features. The results of these calculations, however, are very difficult to relate back to a molecular orbital based picture. Um, and it won't be the focus of my talk today, but just something to be aware of that there are different ways we go about interpreting this. Um, and the last sort of approach that's used more in the solid state community is to interpret this in terms of band structure. But in all of this, our goal is sort of ultimately to understand and be able to predict these spectra. And so let's sort of look at these in more detail and see how well we can understand what's happening. Okay, so what we see here is a blow up of what I already showed you on the previous slide, the difference between copper one and copper two. And here, it's pretty easy to understand as the effect of nuclear charge in the metal increases, the edge goes up in energy. But this sort of same pattern happens for um, an iron two versus an iron three tetrathiolate, as well as for ferry versus ferrocyanide. But what I want to point out to you here is look how very different the overall shapes of these edges look. Um, so the, the cyanide ligated edge um, peaks here at 7130. All of it's to much higher energy, um, whereas in the tetraphylate case, 7130 is now hitting well above our lowest energy feature. And so it means that you just need to be very careful about how you make oxidation state assignments based on rising edges, and you really need to be comparing models in similar environments. So we always sort of need more information um, to sort of rigorously interpret what's happening in these edges, but we can certainly get information about trends. Okay, okay. the other effect that um, happens is that the coordination environment can actually affect the rising edge intensity that we observe. Now here I picked a rather dramatic example but this is what happens in a copper one complex. So now we're in a D10 system and we're going from two coordinate to three coordinate to four coordinate. And so you can see that in principle, even my rising edge position appears to change, although these are all formally copper one. Okay. And so we can actually understand this empirically um, in a relatively simple like a field picture. This is work that was done in the late 80s by the group of Ed Solomon. Um, and what they were able to show is, if you think about this, um, if we think about the rising edge as a 1s to 4p transition, then in the absence of any ligands, I have degenerate 4p, x, y, and z orbitals. Now if I think about bringing in these ligands along my z-axis, then I basically have um, an anti-bonding interaction that raises the energy of the 4pz, and my 4p, x, y remain lowest in energy, so my lowest energy transition would be to a doubly degenerate PXY, um, with the PZ being somewhere buried in the rising edge to higher energy. Now, if we go to a three-coordinate complex and now bring in ligands within the YZ plane, both the PY and PZ are raised to higher energy through anti-bonding interactions, 
And now my lowest energy transition is to the 4px, um, and that should be with roughly half the intensity that I saw for the two coordinate, and that's exactly what happens. Okay? When we finally go to a tetrahedral complex, now we bring in um, ligands in px, y, and z, raise all of these in energy, have a greater anti-bonding interaction, and eventually, basically, my 1s to 4p feature becomes buried in the rising edge. And so this is at least a way to kind of empirically get a, a handle on what's happening, and um, these are sort of generally transferable trends. These trends, though, can become complicated by other factors. Um, so in principle, we don't often know exactly where this 1s to 4p 4P feature is occurring. We have the possibility of other processes happening. For instance, um, the idea that you could have 1s to 4P plus ligand to metal charge transfer transitions. And this has been assigned in copper 2 complexes. So here the idea is um, it's a less pronounced effect, but we have changes in this spectral region um, that have to do with the covalency of the metal site. Now these actually happen to be um, copper protein samples. Um, where basically the axial ligand is changing um, and the site actually is varying in the covalency of a copper thiolate bond. Now, the way this is sort of interpreted is that you start um, basically at a ground state with a 3D9 system, so one hole in the 3D manifold. We do a 1s to 4p transition, and in the presence of the 1s core hole, um, your primarily metal-based orbitals can relax below the level of the ligands, allowing for a low energy like ligand to metal charge transfer process. Okay? And so this is what's referred to in X-ray spectroscopy as a shakedown transition, and through a valence bond configuration interaction type model, one can use the intensity of these shakedowns to get some information about um, site um, changes in the covalency of the site. Um, but it's, of course, not all that simple. I'm showing here now another example of what happens as we go now all iron-3 um, with either um, fluorine, chlorine, or bromine coordination. And so even though these are um, all iron-3, again, you can see that the edge positions vary wildly. And that has in part to do probably with differences in covalency over the series. Um, certainly, um, the most ionic um, is the fluoride, which is at higher energy, and as we increase covalency, the edge moves down. Um, but it also probably has to do with the fact that bromine is a much better scatterer than fluorine. And so deconvoluting what's happening in this region, where we basically have both scattering and electronic-like contributions to the rising edge, is one of the challenges. And this is a region of X-ray absorption spectroscopy that um, remains to be rigorously calculated. Okay, but let's focus on the pre-edge, which I said is something that we can right now do very well computationally and can then use it in a much more predictive manner. And I think in this sense it's useful to talk about um, some of the early history of where these pre-edge assignments actually came from. Um, and this is work um, from Schulman um, in the late 1970s, who was at Yale at the time. And what he observed um, is he looked at a series of octahedral complexes um, with manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and zinc. And what he realized is that there was always a weak pre-edge feature as long as there was some open shell D character. And when he got to zinc, which is D10, he noticed that pre-edge was actually absent. And so at that time, he was the first person to sort of assign this as a quadrupole allowed 1s to 3d transition. Um, but at the time, he argued that perhaps one could also get vibronic mixing of 3D and 4P levels. And so one wanted an experiment that could explicitly show this was truly a quadrupole transition. And that came um, just about six years later or so, um, again work from Ed Solomon's lab, where they looked at polarized single crystal X-ray absorption of D4H copper tetrachloride. And so here's um, the molecule that they're actually looking at, where one, in principle, expects um, the possibility of a 1s transition to the unoccupied 3d x squared minus y squared on the copper. And what they saw as they um, took this single crystal and rotated it um, through, the, um, through the beam is that they see a fourfold periodicity, where they have um, 
maximums in the pre edge intensity when they're along the copper chloride bond, and minimums in the intensity when they were bisecting the bond. And so this fourfold periodicity they actually assigned to transitions that experimentally were explicitly to a dx squared minus y squared type orbital. Um, they do, however, interestingly have this constant offset, um, which in principle still could be some amount of contribution from vibronic coupling, or it might even be a slight misalignment of those two molecules within the unit cell. But this just gives you an idea of sort of the history of this and how one went about at least initially explicitly assigning these features. Now, if we know sort of explicitly that these are 1s to 3d transitions, we can use simple knowledge of group theory to understand how these transitions might change in intensity. Okay? And so this is um, a relatively simple example, but what you see here is octahedral ferric tetrachloride, which has a relatively weak pre-edge, and when we go to the tetrahedral, we gain intensity. Now it's quite easy to understand this if we just think about simple group theory. This is a 1s to 3d transition where my 3d orbitals transform as T2g and Eg. My 4p orbitals, however, transform as T1u, so there's no possibility of 3d 4p mixing, and by group theory, this should be just a pure 1s to 3d transition. When we sort of test this and then look at the tetrahedral complexes, now I have my dxy, dxz, and yz that transform as T2. Um, I also have 4p orbitals that transform as T2, and I have formally allowed mixing, which experimentally I can then observe. Um, and this is, a, to me, always a really fun connection for extra absorption spectroscopy because so often you really can go back to your undergraduate group theory, look at the character tables, and start to get some picture of the relationship between symmetry and observed intensity. Um, and that you can do already in the absence of doing any calculation. Okay, the other sort of general paradigm that one can often make about um, extra absorption spectra is when I go um, from a six coordinate complex to a five coordinate complex, it will gain intensity. And again, this is the same basic group theory consideration that when I remove centrosymmetry, I provide a mechanism for PD mixing. And this has been used wildly, um, used widely, um, or perhaps wildly as well, but um, in the um, biochemistry community in order to get information about the coordination environment of iron in a complex protein, okay? Um, and it at least gives you sort of some sort of fingerprint metric of the observed differences. Um, similarly, another sort of clearly established paradigm is this idea that the pre-edges go up about one electron volt in energy as you increase oxidation state. This is a nice series of iron 4, 5, and 6 in relatively similar environments, and that's where you can nicely see that trend. Okay? Um, but part of the reason that, um, that, that we're here and we're doing this workshop is that um, we, we really want to sort of rigorously understand this, to be able to interpret it in theory, um, and not just to have these empirical fingerprints, because sometimes we find there are definitely exceptions to these rules. Um, and this is an example of one of those exceptions. Here I'm showing, again, the same five-coordinate and six-coordinate um, pre-edges I showed, but now this is a six-coordinate iron complex, but because it has this chelating um, this nitride that basically distorts the centrosymmetry, um, it actually increases in intensity. And so if I only use the simple metric that this area increasing intensity relative to the six coordinate um, complex means that five coordinate, I would of course arrive at the wrong conclusion. And so this is just sort of um, a, a cautionary note. Um, similarly, we can look at um, iron four and five complexes reported in the literature that actually appear at the same pre-edge energy. Now the reason for this we can understand once we know the structures, and that actually is because this iron 5 complex is actually um, only 5 coordinate, it has um, a weaker um, ligand field, and so basically it's not as destabilized as it would be if it were 6 coordinate. And so one has to sort of deconvolute all the possible contributions to the pre-edge based on a proposed structure. And so this is where um, ORCA actually comes in. Um, and this is what some of you um, will be doing in the practicals, and that is to use a time-dependent DFT approach to calculate both the dipole, the quadrupole contributions, and the changes in the pre-edge energies. And this is something now um, that we first did with ORCA um, 
quite a few years ago now, just to demonstrate that these simple trends that we already talked through using group theory are reproduced within a computational framework. And so this is a nice comparison where you see, again, what we've looked at already, the same octahedral ferric tetrachloride shown in blue. We calculate that, and we see that all we get are quadruple contributions. In contrast, when we do this for tetrahedral ferric tetrachloride, we see quadruple contributions, but in addition to that, the significant dipole-based contribution that we already predicted looking at a character table, right? And I think that's um, one of the real strengths of this method. We can do the same thing um, with the high valent iron species that I showed you. Um, on the left here are experimental data for a series of iron-4 complexes as well as iron-5 complexes. They do vary in energies and intensities, so that can make sort of simple fingerprints challenging. But what we find in these cases is that um, we can pretty well generally predict the trends in these spectra. Um, and that allows us to use it in a little bit more of a predictive fashion. And this is just another way to show that. Um, we, this is now a series of 20 model complexes. Um, I think by now we've probably applied this to more than 60 complexes at iron alone. Um, and what we find is that we maintain experimental correlations between the areas and intensities, and also between the energies and the intensities um, once a constant shift is applied. And so this allows you to use it in a pretty reliable way. And I hope at least some of you have opportunities to try that during the practicals. Okay, so let's move on from the edge into the exhaust region. But of course, keeping in mind that the information you get from the edge region is now a constraint to help you um, fit your exhaust data. That's always something very useful to keep in mind. Okay. Okay, so the idea with the exhaust region is now um, our photoelectron um, has already been ionized, and we're basically um, approximating it now as a photoelectron wave vector. It's propagating out from the absorbing atom. It can interact with neighboring atoms, get backscattered, and, and arrive back um, at, at the core, basically resulting in these um, oscillatory patterns that are known as the excess. Now, these waves that are backscattered, when they return to the absorbing atom, can be interfering in either a constructive way, which results in maxima in these spectra, or they can be interfering in a destructive way, resulting in minima. Now, in the simplest picture, of course, it's easy to think about single scattering, where we only have one atom, but most of the time we have complex molecules where we can scatter by more than one atom. Um, so here is a, a formal um, multiple scattering path, where I scatter out from the absorber further to another atom and back. Um, and this actually um, gives us some information about angles, especially if we have rigid structures like porphyrins or things, we can get information about um, buckling and, and changes in that multiple scattering. Okay? Um, so ultimately, what one wants to do from excess is to extract information about distances. That's probably what excess can do best. Distances typically have errors on the order of about 0.01 angstroms. So this is its real strength, especially over, um, say, protein crystallography, where the errors tend to be much larger. Um, coordination numbers, though, and I'll explain why in a bit, have much larger errors, so on the order of 20 to 25 percent. This means that from the excess, you probably can't tell five from six coordinate apart, but perhaps with a couple pre-edge analysis together with your ORCA calculations, you could sort this out, okay? Um, types of ligands from excess, one can typically only tell within Z plus or minus one. Um, this means that carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen all look the same from the perspective of excess. They have a similar, similar number of electrons, and as a result, they're similar backscatterers. Um, and this is definitely a limitation, where again, input from other spectroscopy can help you limit your model. You can get some nearest neighbor information. Typically, XS um, doesn't have any strong signal beyond six angstroms, so it does die out as we go further from the absorber site. So it is a relatively local probe. Um, and if we use some, the multiple scattering, we can get bond angle information in some cases. The important thing to keep in mind is that a standard XS measurement sees the average of all photoabsorbers. This means if I have multiple irons in the system that I'm interested in, I see all of those together. And this can be a challenge in terms of deconvoluting 
There are specialized, now site-selective, um, excess measurements that in certain cases can help deconvolute this. And if anybody um, is interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to talk to you about that later. Okay, so let's just take, sorry, take a look at, my pointer is not happy at the moment, so just take a look at really how we get from an X-ray absorption spectrum that comes off the beam line to ultimately processing excess data from which we can extract distance information. And so as I said, what we actually measure is the absorption coefficient mu as a function of energy. This would be um, raw data, sort of idealized example, but nice raw data straight off the beam line. Um, what we would do then is do a pre-edge subtraction to remove um, sort of any background scatter or any absorption from lighter atoms to get this flat spectrum. And then what we need to do is actually extract the excess. This is typically done by applying um, a spline. And the spline is basically designed to approximate the atomic background. Or the idea, what would the um, sort of absorption look like in the absence of any ligands? Um, and so there's actually a separate field of people who look at formerly atomic excess to see the atoms sort of scattering off its own inner atomic potential. Um, for most people wanting to get distance information about near neighbors, this is not something you want, and you want to remove these basically very low R components from your data. And sorry, this isn't appearing at all. Um, but in principle, once you remove that, you get um, this sinusoidal pattern. And this is the excess that you would typically see um, in a publication. And normally, that excess is reported in K space. So K space is in units of reciprocal angstroms. Um, and so this is the actual conversion. Um, it's 2m e minus e naught over h bar squared um, square rooted. And here, um, e naught is basically defined as the origin of your photoelectron wave vector. So you have to define some energy for this conversion, and you define the point at which your excess begins. After that, what you do then is um, go from reciprocal angstrom space to Fourier transformant and end up in R space or in angstrom in distance. So what you end up then with is this Fourier transform here, which I apologize is so hard to see. But basically, if a photoabsorber is sitting here at zero, this intense peak here in the Fourier transform tells you I have a lot of something at roughly two angstroms from my photoabsorber. Okay? And basically, the goal of fitting the excess is basically to deconvolute all the components that contribute to give you this total sine wave. Okay? So let's just look at this. Um, slightly more mathematically. When we look at this, of course, um, for excess, we've done our initial measurement in energy space. We've measured the absorption coefficient mu as a function of energy, and we approximate this atomic background using mu naught. So this is a spline that's relatively low frequency. Um, we subtract that out and then normalize with respect to a Victorine-like function. Um, and as I already mentioned, um, we then typically convert to K space so we're conveniently in reciprocal angstroms for a Fourier transform that ends up in angstrom space. Okay, and so just to sort of understand what's happening here in terms of just um, a simple scattering-like process, we basically can um, sort of approximate our outgoing photoelectron wave vector in terms of this exponential, and then use that same exponential term to approximate the returning photoelectron. But of course the returning photoelectron is modulated, and it's modulated by both an amplitude and a phase of the atom that it's actually scattered off of, okay? And so this would be my F of K and my delta K for the amplitude and phase. So then what we want to do is actually to basically just multiply this out and then use Euler's theorem to go from my exponentials into a sine-like wave. And then we start to get to something that looks a little bit more like the standard excess equation. In the standard excess equation, what we see is that we have a linear dependence on n, which is the coordination number. We're dependent on an amplitude um, and a phase function specific to a given absorber. And then importantly, we have um, a dependence on distance that dies out with 1 over r squared dependence. And this is, of course, what makes excess a local probe. Okay? Now, there's still something that's missing in this very simplified equation. And that is the fact that we haven't incorporated, incorporated any disorder terms. And so disorder gets incorporated in terms of a sigma squared, or for those of you who've done 
um, some crystallography, what's often referred to as a divide waller. So this is our disorder parameter um, to account for the fact that we will have contributions both from thermal disorder as well as from static disorder. Okay. Okay, and so this is just the same thing repeated. I just put this in here for you to define what all of these parameters are. Um, and I should point out that in the excess literature, you will see the amplitude function defined both as f or as big A, um, and the, um, the phase function either as delta or small alpha. So um, I have it both ways in my slides. My apologies, but you'll also see both ways in the literature. Okay, so let's look at this then a little bit more visually to understand the impact of each of these effects on actual um, spectra. Now, these are actually calculated, so just idealized cases to show you the effect of each parameter. Okay, and so what it can do is just first calculate um, the effect of distance. And what we see is, as I take a copper nitrogen vector from two angstroms to three angstroms to four angstroms, I see as I increase distance, um, the frequency of that wave increases, um, and the amplitude decreases, and here you can especially see it if you look at the Fourier transform in angstrom space, it decreases with this 1 over r squared dependence, which again emphasizes why this is a local probe. Okay. Um, perhaps the most obvious effect is the effect of the coordination number, so here if I go from one copper nitrogen to two to three, I simply um, decrease the amplitude of my excess, as well as the amplitude of my Fourier transform, and that effect can be very clearly visualized. Okay. Um, as I already mentioned, both the phase shift and the amplitude will be related to the type of the backscatter. So if I have a copper-copper versus a copper-oxygen, both at two and a half angstroms, you can see that they have very different phase and amplitudes, and most of this comes from the fact that, of course, copper has more electrons, and it's a far better scatterer. But this means that one of the strengths of XS is the ability to um, get very accurate distances for other heavy atoms, and a little bit larger errors on lighter atoms, especially as they get to be further out in distance. Okay, okay. and so now let's look at the effect of Debye-Waller. Um, here I'm just showing Debye-Wallers. Um, these are expressed in terms of angstrom squared, and as the Debye-Waller value increases, of course, my signal also becomes um, similarly attenuated. Um, now, I already mentioned that um, this divide waller can account for both thermal and static disorder. Um, for reasons of radiation damage, most people tend to do um, experiments at low temperatures, so at 10 Kelvin, meaning the thermal contribution is going to be relatively small, and what we mostly are modeling is static disorder. What do I mean by static disorder? Everyone know? Yeah? Right. This way this way. Right, yeah. Or I could also say for static disorder, if I have a nitrogen at 1.95 and another nitrogen at 2.0, unfortunately, excess can't distinguish that. It's not within the resolution of the method. So it will increase my static disorder to have different mean displacements and distances. And that comes out in your Debye Waller factor. Okay? Um, here's another reason that we do these measurements typically at low temperatures. This is a comparison of the excess on the same compound measured at room temperature and measured at 10 Kelvin. And what you can see is that the excess signal becomes attenuated, it dies out very quickly in high K space, and my Fourier transform overall loses intensity and loses the outer shell structure. So in principle, we get a lot more information if we run it at low temperatures. We also find in general it's easier to model because we only worry about static disorder and our simple um, Gaussian based models start to break down when we have both static and thermal contributions. So that's the other reason that that happens. Okay, so let's take a look at this resolution point that I already mentioned. I mentioned one of the problems with XS, if, if I have data out to um, K of 13, my resolution is only about 0.15 angstroms. That means a copper oxygen at 1.90 is not readily separable from a copper nitrogen at 2.1. Um, well, actually I said that wrong, 2.05. Um, so just roughly as a rule of thumb, the resolution in the XS goes as high over 2 delta K. So typically what we want to do is go out in far and K space as we can um, in order to achieve the best resolution. 
And I think the easiest way to understand this is to visualize the Fourier transform as my k-space range actually changes, okay? So what I'm showing you here are um, data on a, um, a molybdenum complex that has two nitrogens bound linearly between, um, uh, two nitrogen atoms bound linearly between the two molybdenums. If I only have data to k of nine, this is what my Fourier transform looks like. Now as I open up the k range, you can see by the end, if I'm lucky enough to get data to k of 21, which doesn't happen very often, you can see that the whole spectrum has greatly sharpened. Okay? And so this is now my resolution parameter, which gives me a much better chance of perhaps separating um, my terminal ligands from, say, my bridging ligands, if I can go further out in k-space. Okay, so um, just to sort of summarize the parameters that we've talked about for XS, Intrinsically, the frequency will give you distance information, the phase shift will tell you the type of atom, and the amplitude will tell you something about the type of atom, the coordination number, and the structural disorder. And this is sort of inherently why we have such large errors on coordination number, um, and we have a lot of problems with properly modeling through by Wallers, so this is kind of where um, the excess analysis has the greatest problem. Um, but in principle, to just a general comment is that all excess analyses uh, often suffer from being inherently underdetermined, and so that's why, again, it's always useful if we have other input from other spectroscopic measurements and we can start to constrain these models. Okay, so just um, to, to take a look at a little bit of multiple scattering, because we haven't talked at all about multiple scattering. Um, here what I'm showing is just a very simple picture of an iron with a bound cyanide. And so single scattering refers to just this iron carbon scattering pathway um, that, that goes directly back, back or what we would refer to as a two-leg pathway. We can also have single scattering at longer distance, so the iron scatters off the nitrogen and comes back. Or we can have so-called three-leg paths where we go iron, carbon, nitrogen and back or a four-leg path where we interact with every atom, both on the outgoing and the return path. And so um, the reason I'm just mentioning this is that when one fits excess, what you want to do is sort of to hopefully define these units and treat them in concert. Otherwise, you can see you quickly arrive at a very large number of free parameters. Um, and the nice thing, though, about this is, is that um, if one can constrain this, you can get out angular information. And so here I'm showing now again this iron carbon nitrogen interaction. And of course, as I change the angle, the single scattering actually always stays the same because this distance is fixed. Um, but what you can see is when I'm at 180 degrees, my multiple scattering is at a maximum. That's because when all of these three atoms are in a linear arrangement, I have a forward focusing effect giving me maximum Fourier transfer <laughs> intensity. And as I bend this bond, I start to lose intensity. And I don't start to gain intensity again until the angle is so steep that it's effectively a second bond. Okay? And so this is just to give you a little bit of a visual about how one would go about getting angular information out of these data. Um, and of course, we chose a really simple three-atom example, but you can already imagine the complexity that arises when you go, for instance, to add um, a histidine ring. Um, and then you can imagine a large number of paths where, again, you would want to treat this in a concerted way. And we could then basically look at what happens in terms of actually changing the orientation of this ring, um, wagging it in the plane or out of the plane, will greatly change these multiple scattering contributions. And so this is sort of a more complex part of this analysis. Okay. Um, there are um, different approaches in terms of actually how you model XSAS data. Um, I'm actually not going to read through these slides, but just to basically say that um, people either use, um, and probably not really at all anymore, people once used empirical approaches to sort of extract phase and amplitude parameters from models. Um, now, sort of more likely, people use multiple scattering-based theory, and this is largely probably the dominant code worldwide is now FEF. Um, for calculating all of these multiple scattering interactions. Okay. And so the, the general sort of idea with this is that one first builds an initial model, uses a code like FEF to calculate distance and disorder parameters, optimizes those parameters um, against experiments, uh, 
see if that's reasonably good and sort of keep looping until one has some sort of optimal or range of optimal fits. Okay. But I think um, the reason in part that we're not doing excess analysis as part of these practicals is that the current state of excess theory is, I would say, yet to be predictive. We can't simply put in a model and predict spectra without fitting. Um, we actually looked at this recently, um, and what you can see, for instance, um, here um, are the data in black um, for a manganese dimer, um, and then basically different um, calculated levels of theory, either using a known crystal structure or using geometry, geometry optimized structures, or inputting um, from DFT frequency calculations to better model the Dubai Wallers. Um, and what you see actually, that works pretty well for the first shell interactions, but out here, in terms of the multiple scattering, neither the red, green, or blue line look anything like the black line, which is the data out in this region. Okay? And so this is just still one of the limitations, which limits the, the predictive ability. Um, but that said, um, if we have a relatively simple monomer, like in this case, um, you can see we can predict it pretty well. So our major problems have to do with these angular displacements and the longer range order that we really can't model very well. But what you can do really well is to get the first shell distances. Okay, so in um, the last part of my talk, I wanted to switch from X-ray absorption and talk how we can get from more from just a standard X-ray absorption by actually um, measuring higher resolution and looking at the emission. And so this is the schematic um, that we already looked at before um, in terms of how we would measure uh, concentrated samples. Um, and I already mentioned that typically our dilute samples are measured in fluorescence. And so, of course, we would measure um, the 2p electron refilling the 1s core hole, giving us an intense k-alpha line. But of course, there's other events happening inside your sample after you create that core hole. A 2p electron can refill the 1s core hole. This is the k-alpha. Similarly, um, a 3p electron could refill that 1s core hole, and on top of that, there are all kinds of scattering events. Okay? So one way to actually limit this is to use a detector that actually has some ability to, um, to, to resolve um, features based on their energy. Typical solid state detectors have energy resolutions um, or resolving powers of about 40. That means that iron, I can separate, um, I can sort of set a window that's about 150 to 200 electron volts wide, but that's really wide and I'm not really going to be able to see any fine structure. So the way to start seeing fine structure to overcome the limitations of most solid state detectors is to go back to simple physics and to use a Bragg optic not only upstream for your monochromator, but downstream for your detection. And so the basic idea in terms of modifying this experiment is first I have my incident beam that's shown here as a pink line my sample fluoresces, and now instead of going directly to my solid state detector, it first goes to a crystal, which is a Bragg optic, aligned on a Roland geometry. Um, so just to sort of take a look at that more schematically, I'm showing you what the Roland circle looks like here. My sample's sitting here, it's fluorescing, it goes on to the analyzer crystal, and comes back to the detector. And this angular relationship here, and of course dependent on the despacing of my crystal, by Bragg's law then selects for a specific energy, but now with a resolving power of about 5,000. So instead of being able to measure 150 or 200 EV resolution, I can get down to one EV level resolution by using an optic. Okay. And so basically this enables um, other classes of experiments um, where we basically use the higher energy detected emission to either do different types of X-ray absorption or to get um, intrinsically um, high resolution emission data, which themselves are quite informative. Okay, so let's just look at this process in detail. Imagine again, this is um, an energy level diagram again for iron. So I'm just biased to iron, I guess. If we do first the 1s um, excitation, the most likely we already said was a K alpha, so 2p to 1s. This is going to be experimentally dominated by contributions from the 2p spin orbit, so it will split into two K alpha lines. Um, this does allow you to detect X-ray absorption at higher resolution. I won't talk about this today, but for those of you who are interested, there are recent papers in the literature describing a method known as HERFT, or High Energy Resolution Fluorescence Detection, 
which basically overcomes the limitations of the core whole lifetime broadening. Um, and so a lot of the spectra that maybe look a little bit featureless can become more featured by using this kind of approach. Okay, then the next possibility is a 3p to 1s electron. This is the so-called k-beta line. It's going to be about an order of magnitude weaker than the k-alpha, but for those of you that are interested in metal complexes of any kind, these spectra are going to be dominated by the 3p uh, 3d exchange. So it can, in some sense, be used as a spin state marker. Um, recent work from our group has shown that there are also strong covalent contributions to these spectra, which complicated its use as a simple fingerprint. But, but there is intrinsically some information about spin in these spectra. Um, these types of spectra have also been used to enable oxidation state and spin-dependent X-ray absorption. And so people have actually used this to detect separately the iron-2 and iron-3 sites of Prussian blue, for instance, and deconvolute the two contributions. That was work of Peter Glotzel. The, the other possibility is a valence electron refills the 1s core hole. This is going to be about 1,000 times weaker, but because it's a valence electron, it's very sensitive to the ligand environment, um, the ligand identity, its ionization potential, the protonation state. Um, and a principal um, recent work in our group has shown that you can use this to start to get ligand selective X-ray absorption, so to use a given emission feature and then detect the corresponding X-ray absorption. And again, I won't talk about that, but instead we'll just go through a very general review um, of the kinds of things that you can get out of these spectra um, and, and how you can understand them in a simple picture. And so what I'll start by showing you is just ferric k-beta X-ray emission data first at the main line. So these are the main lines for a series of simple iron complexes where we're either um, ferric tetrachloride, ferric acac, or a ferric porphyrin with an axial chloride, and below a series of low spin complexes, ferric hexacyanide, ferric tachin, and a ferric TPP bis imidazol. And what you can immediately see is that there is a large change in the overall shape of these main lines, and this has simply to do with the number of unpaired electrons and the extent of PV exchange, which of course will be much larger for a 5 half system than for an S equals 1 half system. And so this was the spin state marker reference that I made um, before. We can also then take a look at the corresponding valence to core emission um, for these same compounds. And what you see is although they look quite similar at the K-beta main line, there are dramatic differences in the valence to core region. Um, and that holds for both um, the high spin ferric complexes as well as the low spin ferric complexes. And what you can note is that also, I'm just blowing up the um, y-axis here, is that the intensity varies quite dramatically um, with high spin complexes giving much weaker signals than low spin complexes. This has largely to do with metal ligand bond lengths and the extent of metal p mix that you can get um, depending on the metal ligand bond strength. Okay? Um, but effectively, um, one can also see the same trends for a, a related series of ferrous complexes. Again, the differences between high spin and low spin. Um, and in the valence region, there are higher intensities for all the low spin complexes. And here, what's kind of interesting is um, we talked about sort of the difference between octahedral and tetrahedral at the pre edge, right? And in the pre edge, it really gained intensity. But here, what we see is this is now octahedral and tetrahedral, the red and the blue. Here, um, the red and the blue, they basically um, come close to overlaying. And so this is kind of um, something that we'll, we'll get back to when we look at the calculations. I'm actually going to just skip ahead. Um, so this, these were trends that we, we wanted to understand. And so again, we, we went to actually compute this within ORCA. As I mentioned before, this is um, a very simple approach. It uses only a one electron simple ground state DFT and just takes the energy difference between those one electron cone sham orbitals. Um, and really, um, all that we require in this transition is that the molecular orbital involved in the emission process has some amount of metal character. Um, and so I want to actually take a look at, at what we actually calculated here. And here you can see that we got really good correlations between experiment and theory, um, and we see that it's basically 97% dipole contribution. Um, now, if we go back to what I mentioned before about this um, octahedral and tetrahedral ferric tetrachloride, you can see in the valence emission, they basically superimpose. 
And by theory, they're also um, effectively identical. And this is kind of interesting because it sort of tells you that it's a different selection rule, right? So in the X-ray absorption, we really are doing a 1S to 3D transition. And here, all that matters is we have some amount of P character in a ligand-based orbital. And so um, this is just a reminder. Here you see the octa octahedral and tetrahedral are fairly similar. Um, and this is because most of these transitions are coming from ligand-based orbitals with a small amount of metal P, as opposed to this case where we're directly probing the D and seeing the intensity gain relatively, okay? And so this kind of, um, the way I like to think about this, if you think about putting these two experiments together, you effectively have a probe of <coughs> occupied and unoccupied um, levels in a simple sort of molecular orbital picture that hopefully sort of pieces together from these two pieces of information, with one piece of it being far more sensitive to local site symmetry than the other. And the, the valence emission is really going to be dominated by the ligand identity um, and the distance. And so in a simple picture, the way you can look at this is that in something like ferrous tetrachloride, if you look at the molecular orbitals that are primarily giving rise to the observed transitions, these are largely um, chlorine P type um, orbitals, and to lower energy, the more localized um, chlorine 3S orbitals. Okay. This picture um, quickly becomes more complicated, even just going to something like TACN, because then we're talking about the linear combinations of orbitals that give rise to this, right? And so this is again why computations can be very helpful um, in terms of assigning these transitions. So I already mentioned that there are large differences in, in intensity in terms of high spin and low spin sites, and this really has to come with um, the, the metal ligand distance and how much P mixing you can actually get into um, the ligand. And of course, um, that is mediated through covalency. So at the shortest metal ligand bond distance, one predicts the greatest valence emission intensities. And as we um, increase the distance, there should be um, a clear fall off in that intensity. And so this just gives you sort of a visual way to understand it. And you already then just by looking at valence emission data have some um, indirect information about the local structure which in principle, because of the strong correlation to a simple DFT picture, you should be able to readily validate. Okay, and as I mentioned, it's very sensitive to ionization potential. So as you go from something like nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine, what you nicely see are that these um, 2S features in the valence emission, they basically just walk in energy um, by almost 10 electron volts simply due to the difference in the ionization potential. And this is really useful, right? Because this is something that excess can separate out, but the valence emission can. Now for the two P-based orbitals, this becomes more complicated because they'll also have differences in the covalent interactions. But um, it can be a really useful way to identify light atoms. Further, um, it can also be used to get information about the ligand hybridization or the ligand protonation state. So we can actually see how in particular these weak 2S features will change upon a change of either um, hybridization, which results in um, an overall sort of smearing of the contributions or a protonation event. Um, and work by Vera Kravold, who's one of your, um, has been one of your tutors this week, um, has shown that XDS is directly sensitive to uh, protonation events. So what she did was to look at a series of manganese 4 oxos um, where you had either a bisoxo, an oxohydroxo, or a bishydroxo, but otherwise basically the same ligand environment. And what you can see here, particularly in the valence decor, is this is the bisoxo. The oxohydroxo gets two features, and the bishydroxo only one. There are also corresponding changes in the 2,5 region. Um, and so this is just a nice way to sort of get um, information about local site um, coordination changes. And again, it can be used to, to complement other methods. Okay, but um, one of the last points I wanted to touch on with these valence emission spectra is just to sort of ask the question of, can we understand how the ligand actually contributes to these spectra? And so one of the things that you'll see here is I've just chosen um, iron tachin, iron ac -ac, um, and iron hexacyanide. And so I went from a sigma only donor um, to a sigma donor uh, pi donor to a sigma donor pi acceptor. And I, at least we made the visual note that these are really different spectra. And can we understand how really the ligand is actually contributing to these spectra? 
And so what I already said is that the intensity mechanism for this is that you just need some amount of iron P character to mix into whatever molecular orbital that is to give you this dipole allowed um, transition into the iron 1s core hole. But if we want to map out um, the nature of the ligand, what we need to then think about is what if I thought about a different thought experiment? Instead, looked at what happens as I do a direct ligand P to ligand 1s transition. Okay, so this should be, a, in principle, an experiment where I have lots of intensity, um, but I just need to think about it first in the absence of any metal. So what would my pure ligand emission look like for, say, something like as simple as ammonia? And so this takes you back to your undergrad. Um, this is a very obviously simple MO diagram to construct. And we look at the, um, the A1, the E, and the A2 lone pair of ammonia. And what you can see is there's a huge prediction and calculated intensity. Um, but now I need to sort of modulate this into something that could interact with iron. Okay? And so still calculating this from the perspective of the ligand, I can take six ammonias, arrange them in space, and I get the red spectrum. I then put in a point charge, overall three plus, and you can see the major modulation of this, and my pointer is dying, is that I get a stabilization of this lone pair. Yeah, so that's the actual charge stabilization of that lone pair is what we're showing in the computation. Now, if I replace in the computer that point charge with an actual iron, I get the green spectrum, which you can see is actually still quite similar to the point charge. So the major effect here is just stabilization of that lone pair. And then what we can do is basically try to map, if we're trying to deconvolute this, what's happening in the ligand emission and how do those orbitals map into the iron emission? So if I first align my lowest lying um, orbitals, then I can basically see that almost all of my ligand emission intensity comes from the lone pair that interacts with the ammonia. Okay? And this is just sort of a way to sort of piece that out and understand what's happening. But it explains why for a sigma donor, you would have just a single intense peak in these spectra. And so it gives you kind of a, a fingerprint for understanding that. Now when we get to something like cyanide, um, and again just sort of um, construct our molecular orbital diagram, um, we would of course predict that we have both sigma 2s 2s bonding and antibonding, as well as the pi um, 2p 2p contributions. But when we actually map this out in terms of what's really contributing to the iron emission, we see unfortunately we're blind to any um, pi type interactions because they're not actually directly interacting to give rise to iron P mixing. So it turns out that these spectra are largely dominated by um, the, the sigma 2s 2s antibonding and sigma 2p 2p interaction. But that's why, at least for more complex ligands, you start to see different peak and intensity distributions. And so, um, in terms of a kind of take home lesson for you guys, is to sort of think of if there is a molecule that you can draw the molecular orbital diagram for, figure out what the symmetry adaptive linear combinations of orbitals are that make up that spectrum, um, then you basically um, can start to predict what your X-ray emission should look like. So this is, um, again, an assignment that I gave in my undergrad course, which was, of course, probably many of you have done this before yourselves, is to, to calculate for ferrocene, the, or to, to work out for ferrocene what the molecular orbital um, diagram should look like. And so in D5D symmetry, um, we would have the 2s transforming as A2u and E1u, and then we can similarly predict um, the levels for all the 2p combinations. And what's really nice about valence emission is basically each of these features corresponds to an observed experimental feature. And so in terms of the systems that you're thinking about, there's a really nice, hopefully obvious correlation to theory to make. Okay, and so, um, the other way, and this is something that is happening in the X-ray emission um, practicals, is that we can actually do the calculation and start to deconvolute the fragment co contributions to each of these spectra. So this is an example of how we would do that. Um, this is iron um, pentacarbonyl, and so what we see here are the projections of the carbonyl-based molecular orbitals and the projections of the iron 3D-based molecular orbitals in yellow. If we go to something more complex, um, so now we have three carbonyls and a, a, a cod ligand, we can separately project out now a decrease because we have fewer carbonyl ligands plus the contribution of cod plus the d orbital contributions. 
And this is just nice because, um, in a way, we can use each fragment sort of as a fingerprint um, to build up these spectra. Um, and we can use the MO Analyzer program, um, written by um, a former postdoc in my group, Mario Delgado, to actually directly read the ORCA outputs and to start to generate these kinds of spectra from experiment. Um, and so I guess um, what I wanted to just sort of wrap up with in saying is that what I hope that I showed you is just sort of this complementarity of these two methods that together you can kind of get a detailed picture of the molecular <coughs> orbitals of your system. Um, I also have um, a section on applications, um, but I think rather than do that, I want to stop at this point and, and just see if you guys have any questions about the material I've covered so far or if there's no questions. Everyone eats coffee? <laughs> Silenced. Okay. Um, I think I'm, I I could keep going through the applications. Should we just do that? Okay. Um, so basically, um, I just have two applications that I wanted to point out. Um, one that uses um, XS to look at that N2 bound intermediate, and then some combined XAS and emission studies that have come from my own group. Um, but this is um, now, although it's an older study from the late 90s, um, this is work of Kit Cummins at MIT and Grant George at Stanford. And it was um, a very nice sort of characterization of a reaction intermediate. And this is, I think, one of the strengths of XS is that oftentimes um, things that can't um, readily be probed, obviously, by crystallographic methods, can be um, probed by XS to get structural information. And this is a reaction that formed, um, in the presence of nitrogen, a purple intermediate. Um, but the structure, um, in the absence of excess data, really nothing was known about it. And I like this example because what they start with here is their monomeric molybdenum starting material, where you can see um, your sort of excess speed pattern. And when you form this purple intermediate, what you see immediately is that the frequency greatly increases. And so already, from what you guys learned today, that increase in frequency should tell you that you have some longer range distance interactions. And so it's a pretty good sign that I may have formed a dimer in the process of this reaction. And then what you see as I let this decay back to a final product, this high frequency signal is once again gone. Okay. And so if we want to actually um, extract structural information from this, um, what can easily be shown is, and I already showed you these excess earlier so you know the answer, um, that the molybdenum actually binds um, dinitrogen directly between those two molybdenums. And I can model that um, in terms of the excess fits, but I think what's also quite nice is it's very sensitive to the local um, arrangement. So not only can I tell like whether this is a cis or trans conformation, but I can really start to, to model the possible phase space. And these data were really used to show that that interaction comes relatively close to linear in this case. Okay, and so um, the last example um, is just work from my own group. This is work we've been doing on the enzyme nitrogenase. And I want to show it more as an example of how we use combined methods to get at a difficult question. And so this is now um, several years old, but the question we were interested in at the time was this enzyme, which is able to convert catalytically um, nitrogen to ammonia, has both this P cluster, which contains eight irons, and this Fimoco site, which has seven irons and a capping molybdenum. And at the time we started this, um, the atom in the center of this cluster was only known to be a light atom, but it couldn't be identified by other methods. And so this is kind of an interesting interplay between different spectroscopies. Um, but basically, it was first designed in crystallography in 2002. Um, and then initially, the biochemist sort of intuitively liked the idea that it would be nitrogen. Um, but the Endor and ESEM spectroscopists came up with that if it is nitrogen, it's not exchangeable. A few years, years later, they said it wasn't nitrogen. The DFT people said it was nitrogen. So that the DFT and the Endor people got together and they said it wasn't carbon or nitrogen unless it was magnetically decoupled. Um, so it was carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen was their result. Um, then people did some uh, QMM calculations. They favored, um, they, they indicated that carbon in the middle was energetically unfavorable, while a separate DFT study by Zalagi favored carbon. Meanwhile, people did nuclear resonance vibrational spectroscopy in excess. They said they could tell there was a light on it, but they couldn't identify it. 
So this was like, for me as an x-ray spectroscopy, something that sounded fun, and we wanted to just, before we did the protein, ask the simple question of, could we identify a carbon in anything? And so we went back to the literature, again, from the early um, 70s, and um, looked at the fact that people at the time had made these six iron clusters with central carbons. And so we wanted this to be sort of our first goal to test the predictive ability of different x-ray methods to get at the composition of this cluster. And so I'm using this kind of more as a tutorial to basically show you why certain methods do and don't work. So let's take a look at this. This is now the experimental data in black for this six iron cluster with a central carbide. And the nice thing we can do, of course, on the computer is we can put a carbon in it in blue, a nitrogen in it in red, or an oxygen in it in orange. And now this just sort of demonstrates my first point, that because these are all similar scatterers, the UFSAFs all look pretty much the same. And this isn't going to help us to distinguish, which is why the, the results of the UFSAF studies were hardly surprising. What was interesting, though, is if you do a carefully calibrated Zanes measurement, what we found is now the experiment, again, is in black. And if we have a carbon, it's the closest agreement in blue. As we put in nitrogen or oxygen, it starts to get further off. And so this is kind of interesting because it really sort of emphasizes the sensitivity of this region, although at least it hadn't been used this way. Um, however, if you go and try to do this using multiple scattering-based approaches, like the FEF code that I mentioned, then what you see is, in terms of experiment and theory, nothing matches. <laughs> so that was kind of disappointing. That's, and, and so we, we obviously wanted a different approach, and so this is why we thought, well, let's try the valence emission. And so we first tried it on this complex um, cluster with the central carbide, the experimental data are in red. And when we did a single point calculation on the 1974 crystal structure, we got the blue spectrum, which isn't bad, but it wasn't perfect. Interestingly, we optimized the structure, we got the light blue spectrum. This inspired us actually to rerun the 1974 crystal structure at low temperature under the same conditions that we had done our measurements, and it basically superimposes our optimized orca structure. So we were really happy with that, but it also says that you can really use this in a relatively predictive way for complex clusters, and what one expects to see in terms of the emission is the shift in both the 2p and the 2s of the carbon. And so this was something that we applied to both FIMOCO, shown in blue, um, delta nif b, which is a gene deletion mutation that contains only the p cluster, and the intact MOFI. And this was the feature um, that clearly appeared um, at 7100. Um, and I'm just showing here now a different spectrum between FIMOCO and the p cluster to sort of enhance the possible contributions from a light atom, we got this derivative-like spectrum. And what we knew from model studies is an oxygen 2s would be here, a nitrogen 2s was here. We had something to higher energy, so empirically, this looked like carbon, and it looked like some of the clearest evidence. But because we had so many computational variations with other models, we wanted to actually calculate this. This was um, heroic uh, computational work done by Mikhail Rommel and, and Frank Nasus group. And what he looked at were all of the possible broken symmetry solutions with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. What I'm showing here are 10 different broken symmetry solutions, all with a central carbide. You can see that they all overlap. This is actually sort of an interesting point about this um, particular spectroscopy. We're pretty insensitive to the type of magnetic coupling because it is a local probe. So in some, point, in some ways, it's a weakness of this method. In other ways, it's a strength because we're blind to certain complications like properly modeling the magnetic structure of this complex cluster. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. Um, and what we were able to show, again, looking at that experimental difference spectrum versus calculated carbide, nitride, or oxide, is that, again, um, there is very strong agreement when it's carbon and no agreement for nitrogen or oxygen. Yeah. And so, again, this is something that my group and I are still working on. We're interested in evolving new methods that use x-ray emission in a more um, selective way, but hopefully this just gives you guys a better idea of the kind of things you can do. And so um, this is sort of just a general summary of the things you can expect to get out of x-ray absorption, excess, um, x-ray emission. Um, 
there's a lot coming, I think, in terms of combined 2D methods and X-ray emission and X-ray absorption that are more akin to what one has seen for a longer time in NMR and vibrational spectroscopy, so expect to see that soon. And then finally, um, I want to thank my group again and all of the tutors and organizers. So thank you. Thank you.